it took probably six to nine hours a day when it first hit to report all of these and to find the information and to try and defend my work. Um, I wasn't eating, my health suffered. Uh, it was incredibly stressful because it was traumatizing. Every time I would go on social media, I would continuously see ads, fake ads for my own work. And uh, with the help of several actual Facebook groups um, that are dedicated to exposing this fraud and busting these scams, I slowly, well, actually quickly learned um, how to issue a DMCA to a website, the information that needed to be included, um, and how to search for my work. Um, it's not enough just to register a copyright. Now I have to actively search the internet for infringements and report the infringements and get it taken down. Otherwise, you know, my artwork will lose attribution. It won't be mine anymore. It will just be an anonymous photo on the internet. No one will be able to know who actually made it. Welcome back to the Animals at Home podcast. My name is Dylan Perrin, and thank you so much for tuning in today. I have a really interesting episode for everybody today. As this podcast continues to evolve and as I branch out into other areas, I really like to explore things that are not necessarily specifically related to keeping reptiles. So I think everything will always tie back to animals in some way. And of course, this episode does as well. It's it's very reptile and snake centric and snake focused but it still kind of explores other areas and and in the episode today i'm speaking with jennifer cook who is an artist and she is the artist behind the work the instagram account snake arts or the website snake arts if you're familiar with that she is an incredible sculptor if you look at her work she produces these incredible bronze pieces that look exactly like living snakes it's, it's amazing other than the color obviously they're all done in bronze and she really focuses mostly on cratalis or rattlesnakes but she does a, a wide array of work as well she did the door handles on the iguana land doors so i'll make sure there's some pictures in the show notes for that as well but anyway she's she's an incredible artist and i love talking to people who are interested in reptiles in a way that maybe is slightly different than you and I who are just sort of standard keepers. And so we talk about in the episode of how she got into producing this type of art. She actually comes from a background of being a little bit afraid of snakes and, and how she got over that and how that fascination grew. We talk about some of the work that she's done in the past. She worked for Disney as a sculptor and, and has a really impressive career. And we discuss how she actually produces the the sculptures that she's working on now, or that's her sort of her main line of work right now, which is these bronze sculptures. And just to listen to her talk about how specific she has to be with the anatomy and how, how well she understands the the way a snake looks and the way a body moves and and things that are way beyond what probably even you and I recognize in our animals because we're not recreating them scale by scale we watch them but we're not having to be so detailed about our observation of them so that was a really fascinating part of this conversation but the lion's share of this conversation focuses focuses on something that is really Un- unfortunate, but that's a total understatement. And that is this plague of fraud that is happening across the creative landscape in, in, in all domains, whether it's art, music, doesn't matter. But when, it, when we're talking about this conversation in particular, we're talking about these bots that essentially have raided Jennifer's website and now they are reproducing these really cheap trinket versions of the artwork so people think that they're buying her artwork and, and it, you know they think they're buying her artwork from her but they're actually buying it from a essentially a criminal syndicate or a crime syndicate in Asia that's producing these little knockoff versions of, of what she's producing and and then the customer gets this little dinky thing that looks nothing like the picture and it is sort of this cascade effect of uh, of crime really of fraud that's exactly what it is so we discuss what that's been like for her how she first discovered it was happening to her what you know the, the process of how this crime syndicates op- operate how facebook and instagram are actually part of the problem and how they aren't really helping the situation and in many ways they are perpetuating it she's actually currently in a lawsuit against facebook so we discuss that as well and we discuss how you can protect your intellectual property if you are an artist or somebody who's creative in any sort of uh, capacity 
Jennifer has some amazing tips on how to make sure you're protecting your work from this sort of thing happening. So this is a super important episode. Like I said, it's not diving into the husbandry of, of keeping animals, but it is so important that we branch out into other areas. And I think it's an, it's a wonderful episode. I had a blast chatting with Jennifer. If you're looking for more information on this episode or any other, make sure you head to animalsathomenetwork.com. There you'll find all the show notes for every episode that has been created. If you're interested in helping produce the show, you can do that at patreon.com slash animals at home. It's not cheap to produce this show, and I try my best to keep shows coming out consistently. So if you are someone who absorbs the content consistently and has the monetary freedom to you know, throw a couple of dollars my way each month, that does really, really help continue to produce the show. So Patreon is a great way to do that. Thank you very much to CustomReptileHabitats.com for sponsoring this episode. There is affiliate links in both the show notes and the YouTube description. If you do make a purchase with that, that link, you will a small commission comes back to me at no extra cost to you. And I think that is it. Let's jump into this episode. Enjoy. Well, Jennifer, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Dylan. I'm super excited to chat with you. This is a slightly of a, a deviation from topics that I normally cover on this podcast. Typically, we're talking about husbandry and you know keeping animals and whatnot. But I do want to fold in other topics and and you were a guest that was recommended to me by another artist we've had on the show, Adeline Robinson, who is an amazing artist. And I had a lot of fun chatting with her. And she, I think she recommended even that last summer. So you've been on my list for a while. So I'm happy that we're able to actually get to, to having this conversation. But before we get into all the details, because there's really a lot to talk about today, I think, I, I'm just curious about your background as far as animals go and reptiles go. Has that been sort of a, a steadfast interest for you for your whole life? Animals have been a steadfast interest for me. Reptiles are a, f- a fairly new interest. Mm. Uh, I had gone through my childhood assuming that I was going to be a veterinarian. Um, that was the only thing that I knew that you could do with animals as a career. I didn't know about biologists or um, educators or the, the, the other things that, that you could do with animals other than be a veterinarian. Um, I had always planned on being being a veterinarian. Uh, my grandfather had a farm with chickens and cows and horses and peacocks and um, reptiles were not on my radar at all. Uh, I come from a very snake phobic, reptile phobic family. Um, my mother actually chopped up a garden hose once because she saw a snake in it. There was no <laughs> snake. There were little pieces of garden hose. Um, oh. <laughs> But uh, she is my biggest convert. She now will actually cut the the bird netting around the um, her garden to release snakes now. Oh, cool. Um, my grandmother always taught me that any any stick on the ground could be a snake. And they are only there to bite you, um, mm. which is just phobic and wrong. And that was what I was raised with until an adult. Um, when I learned that uh, they are, in fact, beautiful creatures and reptiles in particular and across species are exquisite with the details and the geometry and the structure and the colors. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. So did, did you grow up in the South? I did. So, so that's one thing that I think about is, you know, I'm, I grew up in, or I am in Canada and that's where I grew up and we have one species of garter snake here. So people are, you know, the general average population afraid of snakes, just like most people are, but we don't have the same, you know, like if it's a stick, it could be a snake. And, and I, I assume that's mostly due to the fact that there's no venomous snakes here. There, there isn't a real danger with the, the snakes that are roaming around here. Where in the South, of course, you do have some species that, that it is probably a useful tool to make sure kids aren't going to pick up anything. Is that where you see a lot of that phobia kind of stem from? No. Um, Mm. The, we do have venomous snakes here. We have uh, copperheads and cottonmouths and several varieties of rattlesnakes. Um, it seems to be sort of a leftover Judeo-Christian um, mm. little old Southern lady southern, uh, phobic thing. Okay, uh, um, interesting. Yeah, it, it's more of a religious um, persecution, really. Mm-hmm. than um, anything else I've seen. I have friends in other, other cultures in India and China, and um, they don't have the same unreasonable fear. There's a, there is a fear for the venomous snakes, um, but it's, it's not this all snakes bad um, type thing that, that we have around here. 
Yeah. And so it's a narrative that runs deep. Mm-hmm. Very much so. Uh, and it's a very visceral, visceral re- reaction that it's hard to reason with. Mm-hmm. And, and so how did your mindset start to change? Was there an experience that you had that you thought, okay, this is, maybe I'm going about this the wrong way? Yes. I actually um, became friends with a fabulous snake educator, uh, Jim Rogers. And it actually started out with plants. Uh, we had just moved to a house and I had become a recent convert to the native plant movement. And he owned a native plant nursery. And he also was a snake educator and he had most of the native snakes of Georgia. And he would take them to education facilities and do Boy Scout um, demonstrations and schools and education about reptiles and specifically snakes. And he had a, um, a stepping stone that was a death cast off of a rattlesnake and the head had clearly been crushed and I needed plants and he wanted to have that fixed. So we made a trade. It's like, I'll fix that for you because I'm a sculptor in exchange for plants. And this friendship just blossomed and um, he taught me about the snakes and he taught me about the plants and I converted very eagerly. Um, and have been truly um, awestruck, particularly with with snakes and how beautiful they are. I ask that question to a lot of people as far as how they got into reptiles or where the fascination came from. That's probably one of the most unique answers that I've had. It's interesting to come to it a little bit later in life because a lot of people right from the beginning, you you have a dinosaur fascination or something Mm -hmm. and it just bleeds naturally into reptiles. So that's really amazing. So then, you know, you say you're a sculptor and... Mm -hmm. Originally, you were talking about wanting to potentially be a vet and you Mm -hmm. took an artist pathway as a career. So can you tell us a little bit about the background of just your your history with art? Uh, I always doodled. I always um, was sculpting with clay and and dirt in the backyard and um, didn't really take art classes until high school and then really just fell in love with it and took a hard left and went to art school. I still always kept my interest in in animals. Uh, Most of my subjects in art school were animals. And um, graduated and went on to a career in um, commercial sculpting. So was it always sculpting that was, I mean, I'm sure when you were younger, you were probably playing around with lots, but was sculpting kind of the main thing that you you were fascinated by? Uh, Actually, I had intended to be a book illustrator. Mm, Interesting. Um, Yeah. I was uh, in love with The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings and Hildebrandt Brothers and uh, very much wanted to illustrate sci-fi fantasy books Um, and really dragons. Um, So it was actually quite natural to get into reptiles from that because I was always had a fascination with dragons. Mm. Um, But um, when I got to art school, they sat us all down. It was a, a survey course that we all had to go through. And the, each of the heads of the department came in and they said, they would explain a little bit about what they did, the illustration department, the painting department, the sculpture department. And they had 3D design, which was um, industrial design at, the, at that time as well. And when the chair of the illustration department came up, he's like, if you want to become an illustrator because you want to make money at it, pick another major. Mm -hmm. because only the very best of the very best will actually ever succeed at this. So you need to find what it is you're passionate about and what you love and do that. And so I had taken a dual major in painting and sculpture. And then six months later, they completely dropped the dual major and I had to choose between painting and sculpture and I chose sculpture. Mm. That's really cool. And that's probably good advice that, that he gave you. It was excellent advice. Yes. Um, and, and so what about some of the work that you've done? I think you've, you've done some, some you know, th- there's a museum of the handles. I forget the name of the museum. The so Chiricahua Death us. Museum. Chir- yeah, yeah, Chiricahua. Yeah. yeah and, and so can a, you let us know some of the other work that you've done as far as sculpturing, uh, sculpturing goes? Well, I was a commercial sculptor for over 20 years. Um, I worked with Disney and Warner Brothers and Lucasfilms and many other toy and prototype um, companies. And I would do the prototypes for the first product 
And then that prototype would be sent to China and they would manufacture it. Um, but I got to see uh, the line art and the concept for the movies before they were ever released, which was just incredible. Um, a lot of my work was in Disney World uh, and Disneyland, and I've done props for movies and film and TV. And um, I've also done pieces for several museums. I've, the door handles, the rattlesnake door handles for the Chiricahua Desert Museum. Uh, I did a piece for the Venom exhibition at, at the Paris Natural History Museum. And that piece went on to go into the permanent collection at the Belgian National History Museum. That's amazing. And so I'm going back to the the work at Disney and and Lucasfilms and whatnot, that must have been a dream job, especially as somebody who had this interest in, in fantasy and sci-fi to begin with, to be actually on the ground floor there. What was that like? Very much. It was high stress, uh, mm. tight deadlines. Um, you don't deviate from the drawings. Uh, in some of the cases, uh, it was within a half a millimeter tolerance. Wow. Um, you, we had to know the different manufacturing techniques for rotocasting and injection molds. Um, so it was, uh, definitely the fire hose effect where you had to learn fast and you had to keep really honing the skills, which was fabulous to have to come straight out of art school and then work eight to 10 hour days, um, for the best in the industry. Right. Yeah. Those companies don't really mess around as far as work. No, no. And they, they will, um, move on quite quickly. So right. you either keep up or you burn out. Um, but to, to see that I, well, I was raised on Star Wars. Right. And yeah. to get a sneak peek at Phantom Menace when all you had was just that, that initial poster was just incredible. Oh, that must have been amazing. Oh, it was. It was. And super secret. Everything has a code name. You can't discuss it. You can't take the art home. You can't take it out of the studio. Um, you can't show it to anyone. Um, but it was just fabulous to be able to see all of that. So is any of your work from those days something that you can see on screen somewhere or your influence on any of these projects? Uh, if you've ever seen a movie called A Million Ways to Die in the West. Okay, yeah, I've Seth seen that. With yeah. yeah. There's a door handle in the, um, the dream sequence. And I actually did that door handle. Oh, wow. That's super cool. Yeah. Well, that's, that's really cool. I mean, it's one of those jobs that if, I'm, unless you're a sculptor, you probably have no clue even exists. It's just, you know, we don't think about movie props or design that way. It's just something no. that, you know, we all consume that, that media and not think about it. No. And when I went through art school and decided to be a sculptor and go the commercial route, you know, my dream job was Jurassic Park. I wanted to make the animatronic dinosaurs. I wanted to make the creatures that came alive, um, which is sort of the dream that I'm living now. Um, they're not, they're, they're coming to life in my head. And right. most of the things are, are bronze now. Um, but to still be able to uh, approach my artwork with that wild-eyed wonder um, and still do the things that I love. It's just been incredible. So let's talk a little bit about the work that you're doing now. And, you know, mm -hmm. you're creating these bronze sculpts, uh, sculptures, like you, you'd said. I'm curious what, you know, you, you talked about your, your fascination with dragons and how you developed this love for reptiles. But now it seems like you're very focused on creating, you know, sculptures of snakes and, and whatnot. Is there something specific? Like why, why just focus on them? Is it just a deep passion? Uh, it is a passion. It is the desire to, to educate and mm -hmm. overcome that deep, deep distrust and fear um, that is really misplaced and taught to us at an early age. They're fabulous creatures. They're colorful. They move like nothing else in the world. The design elements are, are just endless. Um, they can't go in every form and tie themselves in knots, but they can come very close to it. Uh, there's line, there's form, there's structure to them. And they do evoke such a, a visceral response. And it's a primal reaction 
that I really love to play with and particularly with hardware like the door handles um, because you see them and if you're f- afraid of snakes, then you hesitate to touch them. But if you want to go mm-hmm. through the door, you have to touch them. And that's one of the wonderful things about sculpture is that you frequently do actually get to touch it. And that brings a whole different um, array of senses as opposed to just looking at a painting or hearing a piece of music to see it, to feel it, to feel how cold the bronze is and the different textures. Um, it is just unique to, to sculpture. Well, and that's what's so incredible about your work is other than the color and the you know material, it looks exactly like a snake. It's unbelievable how realistic they are. And so I could imagine if somebody was very afraid of snakes, you would be very apprehensive to even approach one of the, the sculptures, to just be afraid of it actually slithering around because it's just so realistic looking. Yes, I have some very amazing mentors and I seek out uh, herpetologists and herpeticulturalists and people who love and um, study these animals. And I will send pictures in progress and, and try and create a dialogue with these amazing people who are so passionate about the, the animals that they keep and they love. And I teach them to look in a different way. And I ask them questions and get them to look at the creature in a way that they haven't really before. You know, what is the structure? How do the scales change when they reach the tail? Um, What is the shape of the head? Don't just do a scale count. Don't go by, by color and pattern. You know, why is a timber rattlesnake different than an eastern diamondback rattlesnake, which is different than um, a copperhead, which is different than a bushmaster, which is different than a rat snake? You know, what is it if you had to look at the posture of the animal, the structure of the animal, the overall shape? What is it that's going to tell you specifically what that animal is? And that's what I'm trying to get. Um, And it's... it's actually better than veterinary medicine in my mind because I get to talk to the professors every day and show them my work and have a dialogue with them in a way that I really couldn't have if I was um, treating even dogs and cats and puppies and kittens. And that's a really interesting way to put it too because I imagine most people who are professionals who are looking at these animals on a daily basis, they're probably storing that information in a different way. It's like, Mm -hmm. they're almost storing it as like a photo, like, and and they they become so good at distinguishing different species. And, and it's one of those things where they probably, when you ask them to differentiate it through words, they, I bet they struggle because they already have this mental picture, exactly what different things look like and how they move. And maybe they're not, they don't have that power to describe it because it's already logged in their brain. So that's actually fascinating that you have to kind of dig that out of them. And then as an artist, you actually, of course, you're uninterested because you're creating things scale by scale. So sort of crucial to the end product. Yes. And, um, more than even scale by scale is the underlying structure. So I will show them the sculpture. And if I'm good at what I do, then the initial response is, oh, that's a, a trimerosaurus. Oh, that's a crotalus. That's, that doesn't look like an atrox. The posture is wrong. Um, and they will be able to tell me, you know, there's something not quite right, but I don't know what. Mm-hmm. Um, a recent piece I, I um, took to a, a new friend of mine and he looked at it and I asked, is the tail on this snake long enough? And he's like, you know, I don't know. I've never looked at their tails. I've always been concerned about the business end. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah, that's funny. That's, uh, that's really interesting. And, uh, and how important is it for you to use your art and use the, 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 the pieces that you create to sort of work against that initial that we talked we kind of opened up this podcast talking about that deep narrative that runs deep especially where, where you grew up in the south there's that you know any any what's the saying like any dead snake any is a snake good is snake a bad snake yeah exactly so, or and every, so become, every snake is a bad snake and really yeah. there are no bad snakes every snake has a purpose even the venomous snakes it, it's important to me to to have that narrative, to break that barrier and and stop that fear response and have people look at it. They know it's a piece of artwork. Yes, they, there's that initial shock reaction. 
but then to engage the the person that's looking at it, the person that's touching it, and have them kind of step back and go, okay, this is a sculpture. I'm not afraid of a sculpture. Now I'm going to look at this creature and appreciate how how beautiful or fearful even the the sculpture is and why am I responding this way? And if I can get someone to actually look at the sculpture and see how beautiful that these snakes and these reptiles truly are, then perhaps I can create a hesitation um, and stop that all snakes are bad. Stop that Mm -hmm. bad, good response and, and educate and create some appreciation for what I think are just beautiful animals. Yeah, I love that. That's that's a a very noble goal. And I think I can imagine if someone has a positive experience with the sculpture, if they did happen to see a similar species in the wild, it's probably what they're going to think about. They're probably going to go back to that sculpture, you know, seeing this incredible piece of art and think, maybe this, you know, maybe I don't need to get the the shovel out to cut this thing's head off. I can actually just enjoy it from afar. Yes. And... Also, it's the challenge. Um, mm-hmm. There are so many fabulous sculptures of eagles and bears and lions. And in the Western tradition, there are very few really amazing sculptures of snakes in particular and reptiles in general. Um, there are many turtles, very few lizards, very far fewer snakes. Um, and they're more the impression of a snake and not the actual anatomy of a snake or the posture mm. of a snake. Again, it's the, the icon and not, not the way that the lions and the, the zebras and the other animals are depicted um, in a more naturalistic way or in a more beautiful way. It is more of the fear of ev- evocation. That, and I, I try not to do snakes in a uh, defensive pose or an aggressive pose. So just to short circuit that, because there is some mm-hmm. psychology in that as well. And if it's confronting you, then you are not going to accept that animal and stop and look at it. Yes. Yeah. That, that's a really great point. So I, I'd love to, to paint a picture, no pun intended for people, how, how the art is created, just so they can start to build a picture in their mind. If for those who are just listening, maybe not watching uh, on, on YouTube, what, how, how are you creating it? You know, what, what do you, what are your materials and how does it go from uh, assume, assumably clay to a bronze piece? Well, it actually starts out with reference. Uh, okay. I look at pictures. I look at the live references always best. Uh, I will try and find the actual animal, whether it is in a zoo or a private collection or in the wild. Um, and observe it and look at it and see what is it about this animal that that speaks to me. What do I find beautiful about this animal? And then I'll start to do clay studies and sketches. Um, And I'll work very quickly in an oil-based clay to get the pose and the forms because a gaboon viper is a very heavy snake compared to like a whip snake or a rat snake, which is a very slender bodied snake. Uh, And there is quite a bit of anatomy to snakes uh, that people don't realize. Um, so I'll try and get the pose down and the, the forms overall, and then I will mold it in rubber molds and cast a resin, which is a plastic, which is a much harder surface. And from the resin, I'll make sure that the forms are all correct because really scales are just surface detail. Mm -hmm. Um, and once the form of the animal is correct, then I will apply all of the scales and all of the detail in a prototyping wax, which is a very hard, um, opaque wax. And every scale is applied one at a time. And I have volumes of books on snake anatomy, and I have some amazing friends that I can talk to, and I will get scale counts. And I will take photo after photo after photo, and I will send it to them until their eyes cross. And they will check it and say, yes, you've got this right. No, this needs to be changed. And I will keep changing it and changing it until I get it right. Um, trying to hit that sweet spot between um, art and science. Mm-hmm. Because I really want it to be anatomically correct, or at least structurally correct for the animal. Uh, but I also want it to be artistically beautiful. 
Yeah, it, it sounds as as you're talking. It sounds like you. It's pretty crucial to you to have it anatomically correct. It just sounds. Yeah, especially when I look at your work, it's obvious. But you could easily get away with not doing that and and just selling you know sculptures to people who maybe aren't as familiar with the species. But there's something about the work you're producing that you just feel destined to make sure that it's accurate to what mother nature has produced i had done a piece uh the the one for a million ways to die in the west and i posted it on facebook and one of the comments really stung it was it it, someone commented well it looks like a mashup of three or four different species it's not one particular species and i thought oh they're right (laughs) oh you know i'm better than this you know, to have to go from commercial sculpting where there is just half a millimeter tolerance and it has to be a per, a perfect character, I can do that. And in many, many times, um, my interaction or interaction with my artwork is the only chance that someone will have to ever see one of these creatures or, or even come close, especially with the venomous snakes, to touching one of them. So I do want it to be accurate. And if you can touch the piece, I want it to feel like the actual animal. Yeah, it's you, it's it's a species-specific piece, not just a an idea of a snake, which exactly. is, you know, most people could see those door handles and, ha- and they would have no idea. But you're always going to have one snake person in the room that goes, what is that? Mm-hmm. Yes, yeah, so I recently, um, an, another one of those zingers was uh, with COVID. I don't have the same interaction that I had before. And I had done uh, a a crotalus lepidus, which is a rock rattlesnake. But at the same time, I was working on a gaboon viper. And in my head, I had made the body of the, the rattlesnake too heavy. And I did not share at the time. And when I did share, a friend, um, talked to me and he said, you got the body on the snake wrong. It's too heavy. It's too fat. And so I carved off every one of those scales and changed the body and changed it and made it correct. So at that point, that's what, that's what the hard wax at that, that's what the stage you're at. And you're, there's enough, it's a forgiving enough to be able to change it in a way. Yes. Uh, it, with ag- aggressively with rasps and <laughs> okay. a lot of sandpaper um, and a lot of time, I can change it because it's not bronze. Um, so just like if you were to take a knife to plastic, it would shave off. And right. so that's when I can change it. Um, and I can handle it because the the snake forms are so long that if they were clay or anything softer, once it got too 18 inches out from me, I'd whack it on the desk and I'd break the head off. So I really needed something much harder than wax to work in. And that's when I did the resin with the wax on the surface. Something that just comes to my mind thinking about making a sculpture of a snake that I think must be a challenge is just, you know, you're talking about doing challenges with the body size, but I think even just the taper, tapering, you know, tapering from the neck to getting wider to the body, then tapering back down to the tail. That's it's, it's looks so simple, but it's probably one of those things that's just absolutely impossible. It's not impossible, but it is hard because there is anatomy. There is a distinct head. There is a distinct neck, uh, the body and the tail. And then the difference between the sexes of the snakes is the shape of the tail in many cases. Mm-hmm. Um, there's the squish where the the snake goes over a surface or over itself. And then there are muscles underneath and layers of muscles. And is the snake breathing in? Is the snake breathing out? Um, it's this very much the same as uh, action figures and other sculpture and other animals. It's just you have to to know the species, you have to know the animal, and you have to look really hard. Yeah. So it's not just a question of what it you know what body shape it's in. It's yeah. Is it breathing? Is it is it is it aggressive at this moment? Is you know how are mm. the muscles contracting? Yeah. That sounds uh, an infinite amount of things to think about. And then how do you take it from the the resin? to bronze how do you what's the casting process well once the the sculpture is done and approved by the many people who help me uh and look at these for me then i will put another rubber mold on that and uh either take the rubber molds to the foundry or take the model to the foundry uh and then they will make a mold on that or use my mold and cast a wax and this is lost wax casting 
So that wax is then covered in a ceramic shell and burned out so that the wax is not there anymore. It is simply a void and they pour hot bronze into it and then they chip off the ceramic shell. And in most of my work, they've got one shot to do it because the level of detail on the surface is jewelry equivalent on a sculpture sized piece. So if it doesn't cast the first time, it's scrap. There's very, there are very few chances to repair it in the bronze. Wow. So once, once it, so let's say you have a successful cast, there's just one. One. There's, there's no repeating that as you, know, you well, can't make several of them. I can make several of them from that mold, but each, okay, each, right. each wax has to be checked so that all the little scales fill and there's no bubbles and it's just perfect. And then it has to go through that ceramic shell again and the, the wax is gone and they pour bronze. Um, so there is a very limited number of pieces that I can do um, just because it's so time consuming and it's so skill intensive. Uh, right. I found a fabulous foundry that will do my work and has really um, done a good job for me. And speaking of time, I'm, I'm sure this is probably too variable of a question, but r- roughly, let's just say things go relatively smoothly and you're getting green check marks mm-hmm. from the, the, the herp, herpetologist and whatnot. How long w- will it take from sort of conception to having the cast in your hand? About a year. A year? Wow. Yes, because uh, the sculpture from concept to completion usually takes three to four months because it is so detail oriented and there are so many checks and balances and it has to go through the people that either commissioned it or I've asked for help on it. Um, And then the process of going from one rubber mold to a resin and then adding the, the detail on it and wax and then molding it again and then casting another resin and taking that to the foundry. Once it leaves my hands, generally it takes 12 to 15 weeks at the foundry to go through their process. So it will typically take a year from start to finish to have a piece done. It sounds like a tremendous amount of patience you must have to have. I, I can just imagine me doing something similar. I just get so mad at you know breaking things or you know having to restart. I'm sure there's lots of moments where something falls off and you're just constantly having to go back to the drawing board. It has to be right every every step of the way, or you've got to go back and and do it over or fix it. Uh, and the long, thin, curving forms are not typical for foundry work. Um, and, and so they're, they're not the easiest thing to cast. Right. And so, and then now, you know, you have cast for sale. We'll, we'll get into the kind of the annoying side of this conversation in a second, but just to sort of paint this round off this, this image of, of, of your work, you have a website right now, snake art. You're selling these to, to folks who, who are interested in them. I, I recommend everybody go check out the website at least to check out the work. Cause it is amazing. And so are you right now, this is your full time work i mean imagine it sounds like it takes full time so you wake up in the morning and then you go sculpting and you go to bed (laughs) i do i do and in there i uh i cook dinner and walk the dog and deal with family and uh um, talk to my kids but yes i am a full-time sculptor and i am full-time fine art now is that a dream come true for you actually i never really uh, I always wanted to be a commercial artist. Uh, the fine art has sort of found me. Um, I now make art that I want to see in the world um, instead of the commercial, more commercial side of it, where it was a, a product um, that was to be bought and thrown away. I really would prefer now to make something that's going to outlast me and um, be appreciated by my grandchildren and longer. Right. I guess a one final question for just to paint the picture for people. Size-wise, mm-hmm. what, what, are they all sort of different sizes or can you roughly give us, I think this will be relevant for a little bit later in the conversation, but what's the general size of, of a cast once it's done? I try for life size. Okay, so, okay, wow. So the, the rattlesnakes for the Chiricahua Desert Museum are life size for Western diamondback rattlesnakes. They are, if you were to uncoil them, they'd be almost three feet long each. Um, wow. 
so I'm aiming for the size of a healthy adult. Um, but bronze is expensive, so I can work smaller. I have done um, jewelry design and done pieces that uh, could fit inside of um, a thimble. And I have also done architectural pieces that are on the sides of buildings. So you've really done the, the full spectrum of, of, of things. And it sounds like the bread and butter is right now is at that sort of anatomically correct sculptures. And I think we've definitely done a good job of just highlighting how much, how meticulous you are, how incredible your work is and how important it is to have, you know, there's only so much people who are rep, you know, snake people can do to help change the perspective for people. You know, you know, it's hard to just show somebody a snake and hope that they enjoy it. And even going through an education process, it doesn't always work. So I love the fact that you're doing that with a very unique path and in using art and, and the production of your work to, to help help us help help the and help the animals and help make people appreciate how beautiful they are and and how important they are for for mm-hmm. the ecosystem so now let's talk about some of the annoying is annoying is a huge understatement for what you're dealing yes. with right now so why don't we just talk we'll jump into this fraudulent side the fraudulent dealers and some of the really annoying stuff that you're dealing with so why don't we start with how, how this started tell, tell me from the beginning how this originally popped into your life well, I had started a very small Etsy uh, store to sell the resin casts of the, the snakes. Um, I do a, a lower price point item, which is a resin, which is the plastic that looks like bronze. And I had sold through Etsy and um, was not happy with the platform. And so I had a portfolio site online for many years called snakearts.com. And I, uh, back in 21, decided to leave the Etsy platform and put e-commerce on my portfolio site. And so I had redesigned my website and the new e-commerce version of my website went live on June 1st of 21. And I woke up June 2nd of 2021 and saw ads using my photographs from my website all over Facebook and Instagram. And I was shocked. It's like, what is going on here? I have not paid for ads. And I clicked through and it was not my website. They were my photos. My watermarks had been taken off of the photos. And there were these dozens of websites claiming to sell my work. Um, and it was, they were my photos and my photos of my work. And I was just floored. I did not know what was going on. And so I looked and I Googled and I found out how to report these. These are copyright infringement. And I was reporting to Facebook and I was reporting, um, to the websites, trying to get my work taken off of them. Um, they were not sending out anything initially. Um, but these scam sites about three months in, uh, people started having, uh, things delivered to them and they were really, really bad, tiny plastic copies, um, that were also copyright infringement because the pose of the creatures was, were the same, but the quality was awful. The size was tiny. They were absolutely unusable. Um, but angry people, uh, who had ordered and then either received nothing or received these counterfeits contacted me because the websites were getting taken down. Um, but if you do a Google image search, they would find my website and they were, Mm. they were very angry. They were saying, you scammed me. This is not what was in the picture. And, um, It's like, look, I did not scam you. I posted all over my social media accounts that this was fraud. And I tried as hard as I could to get all of these images taken down. Um, And I've been mostly successful with this, but not completely successful. Um, It's just amazing the speed at at which it happens, how quickly they can go. It was within 12 hours of me changing to an e-commerce site 
I had had less than 72 unique visitors to the new website when it was launched, but one of those was a bot uh, that, and the internet is full of bots. Um, Mm -hmm. And particularly with e-commerce sites, uh, it is automatic. There's an automatic scraping that occurs with many of these bots and all of your images and all of your data will go uh, essentially to a database and criminals look for unique and trending products and they will steal those images and claim to sell them. So how do they actually go about producing, the, even though they're really dinky little bad mm-hmm. representations of the actual art, how are are they somehow using some sort of software in order to produce a 3D mold no. from just an image? No, the, the counterfeits that I've seen are, are hand done. Um, oh. And yes, um, and they're produced in China. Uh, and from the best that I can discern, um, these scammers will take the photographs of products and they will post it on social media to see what kind of engagement it gets. And a high like or high share number, um, will determine how many more ads that they will place. And then once they have enough people buy on the scam, then they will find a, just a garage manufacturer in China to create as close to it as they can get, as cheap as they can make. And um, I actually had an email sent to my website um, encouraging me to post more pictures that they'd make everything I've ever made for $5. <laughs> oh. Uh, so that's uh, kind of a red flag there. <laughs> uh, yes. So, um, uh, and there's a current craze with drop shipping, which yes. is you set up an online store and you populate it with products from a manufacturer like Alibaba. And then you mark it up, you sell it, and you never touch the product. You just ship it out. And mm-hmm. that's where most of these scams are going. Um, once they have a product that they want to manufacture, they will post it on Alibaba and get bids and then they will make the knockoff copies. Right. Um, and then they'll send that back out, um, through all of these drop shipping websites. And I imagine that the prices that our people are paying for these items on the knockoff websites are much less than what your actual artwork is, is priced at. One tenth to one one hundredth. The, okay. the pair of door handles, now remember, they're life-size rattlesnakes and they're in bronze and they can be used to open heavy steel doors, which they do. Um, and they cost me several thousand dollars each to produce. And that pair of door handles in the scam ads was being sold for $50. Wow. And what the people actually got when they finally got something. Um, They were about six inches long and they were plastic, spray painted gold (laughs) and absolutely unusable. (laughs) Yeah. Well, in some ways there's that buyer beware situation as well, where if you're buying something that looks like it should be worth hundreds of dollars and you're getting a really good deal buying it for 15, you may want to be thinking this might not seem right. But at the same time, you know, it, it could easily happen where a, a website looks legitimate and, and you the, the pictures look real and you're hoping and the to pictures, get this. And the pictures are real. And right. the entire website is populated with these amazing handmade products um, that are real products. They're just not the real seller. Right. So there's many of these scammers are scraping Etsy because Etsy discourages watermarks and you can find some fabulous stuff on Etsy. Um, they're scraping Board Panda and My Modern Met and web social media sites that will um, promote artists and trending artwork. Uh, and if it has a high engagement, they'll just take the photos and claim to sell the, the work. And most people are not aware that there are um, so many of these these scam websites. I mean, for me, there were at least 64 Facebook pages uh, that were all fake websites. And many of those 64 pages have three or four more still on Facebook with the same name. Um, They're frequently run by, from 
what several of the scam buster groups that I've joined have told me, uh, crime syndicates out of Southeast Asia. Um, okay. And they're, they're ghosts. Um, they have people that are stuck in rooms running these scams, trying to get as much money as they can. And they're placing ads using stolen credit cards and hacked accounts. So they don't have a problem placing 200 ads for a fraudulent product because it's not their money. So you keep seeing it and you see it on social media and you're inundated with it. And if you keep seeing it over and over and over again, you think, wow, this is fabulous. Um, I would really love to have this. I keep, you know, th then there's the whole fake review thing where people say this is wonderful um, and it's not wonderful. Um, and so you're tempted and you buy it. I mean, you're out, what, 50 bucks? Well, sometimes you're out 50 bucks and sometimes they take your credit card and your information and then they'll buy Uber rides or uh, they'll charge your credit card to place more scam ads. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. I mean, if you're typing your credit card into a fraudulent website, uh, it doesn't seem like the safest place to be giving that information. No, but the website looks legit. What you know, about the URL for the website? Is is the URL for the website some something some semblance of what it could have been? You know, uh, the URL is uh, usually a giveaway. It's typically gibberish. Okay. Um, okay. So that's a good signal for people. Yes, or, or something really really odd. Uh, in my case, it was peachoolong.net. <laughs> um, then there was pastmemories.net. Uh, D D L Y D D S dot com. Um, so, uh, but many of the pages are all the same template, um, right. and they can run thousands of websites using the same uh, the same information. Essentially, the same website that resol resolves to thousands of different URLs. But the content is all the same and it's all stolen. Can you talk a little bit about, you had mentioned a few minutes ago, but even the pose of the sculpture is copy, a, a, you know, a copyright piece. When, mm -hmm. when you do pr produce a piece of artwork, do you have to go and actually go through the process of legally having it copywritten? Or, or is that something just by the virtue of producing artwork that is a copyright piece of material? In many countries, copyright is, and even in the United States, copyright is automatic at the time the piece is in fixed and tangible form. However, in the United States, you must have registered your copyright if you are going to bring a lawsuit. So in order to protect your work in the United States, it must be registered copyright. Now, that is not the same uh, as the law in Canada and the UK, uh, where it is copyright protected as soon as it's done. So it almost seems like it, what what's the point of ha having it a copy copyright upon co completion if you it has no legal weight? I agree, um, and in in my case now I will copyright. I will actually go through the process and pay to register the piece as soon as it's finished before I ever share it um, online, because I have been promised that anything I make will be counterfeit. Um, and I want the legal standing to be able to defend my work. Well, it's just it's such an annoying problem. It's like the last thing that you would possibly want to be having to deal with. You're already going through all this painstaking work to create this beautiful work and you know, going back and forth with all these people and, and producing these amazing things. And then this is just a, a tangent of your life that you probably weren't expecting. And it's, I can't imagine how stressful it has been for you. It has been incredibly stressful. It's been incredibly costly. Uh, my website is now not an e-commerce site. Um, I will now only sell through shows like Tinley and galleries. I will not do an e-commerce site any longer. Um, I have had multiple um, attempts from the scammers. Now the thing is the short form video like TikTok. Um, so products are being sold that way. And I have had multiple attempts to buy one of each of things so they I'm assuming so that they can take videos of it in order to 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 further the scam. It took probably six to nine hours a day when it first hit to report all of these and to find the information and to try and defend my work. 
Um, I wasn't eating. My health suffered. Uh, it was incredibly stressful because it was traumatizing. Every time I would go on social media, I would continuously see ads, fake ads for my own work. And uh, with the help of several actual Facebook groups um, that are dedicated to exposing this fraud and busting these scams, I slowly, well, actually quickly learned um, how to issue a DMCA to a website, the information that needed to be included, um, and how to search for my work. Um, It's not enough just to register a copyright. Now I have to actively search the internet for infringements and report the infringements and get it taken down. Otherwise, you know, my artwork will lose attribution. It won't be mine anymore. It will just be an anonymous photo on the internet. No one will be able to know who actually made it. It's, it seems like it's such a violation. I'm sure that's how it felt because, and, and I'm sure it felt very much so violating. And then also like you were screaming into a pillow because there's nobody there to help you at first. I'm sure, I'm sure. I mean, you're dealing with massive companies like Facebook and, and Instagram and whatnot. And it probably just felt like there was nobody that was going to listen to this massive problem in your life. No, there was no one. You, I would submit uh, takedown forms. Um, and it would be rejected for trademark infringement. It's like, no, I submitted this for copyright infringement. And the, the scammers adapted so quickly that um, Facebook requires that you put in each individually, in individual ad ID. Each, each ad has an ID that is unique to it. Even if the shop was running 200 ad, ads, I would have to report each ad number. And while I was reporting eight ads, then it would go to 28 ads. And then it would go to 58 ads. And in one case, it went up to 208 ads while I was reporting the first eight. Wow. Um, And I got very angry. I got very upset. I thought this can't possibly be happening. They, they can't possibly know what's happening. They wouldn't allow it. It's all straight up fraud. There's no legitimate, um, it's not fair use and there's no legitimate product being sold. And it's clearly copyright infringement because I'm reporting it. Uh, so I did some more research and I actually started reading um, like about Facebook and their IP protection and found their lawyer for intellectual property and found his phone number. And I called him and um, talked to him. And did he answer his phone when you first... He actually oh. answered his phone. Yes, he did. Wow, that's amazing. And I, I mean, I'm not going to boast for Facebook. I'm just saying that's incredible that a lawyer would answer their phone at such a high caliber position. I know. And I talked to him and I explained things and uh, forwarded him personally what I was going through. And within two hours, the ads came down. Uh, And then two hours later, they went back up. Right. So even Facebook's intellectual property lawyer can't stop this. Um, Most of the fake websites that carried my work have been taken down. uh, And I have done a good job with that. But the same ads that I have reported are still on Facebook as shared posts and likes. So really, even though I have reported the content, it's still up and it's still clickable, even though it goes to no website any longer. So I'm still losing uh, the right of authorship and it's still copyright infringement because they're photos of my work. And they don't link to my website. Is it your impression that Facebook is just dealing with a tsunami of fraudulent ads and fraudulent people, you know, fraudsters essentially using using the platform? Or is there, are they just not caring about it? Or they don't have enough infrastructure to deal with it? It's both. Okay. I think it's both. Uh, Their their content moderation system is farmed out. Um, And it's, uh, it's a third party group. And they don't have the staffing and they, um, again, it is a tsunami because the scammers don't have a budget. They're working with, with 
stolen credit cards to place these yeah. ads. And Facebook and social media have made it so easy to place an ad. There's no checks. There's no balances. They don't make sure that this is a, a real business. Um, and and let's not forget, this, there's that's a revenue stream for Facebook as well. It's, the ad you know, that's is where revenue, that money is going. Yes, yes, the ad is a revenue stream, as well as the ads themselves create uh, a data stream for Facebook to use to tweak their algorithm and determine who's going to buy what, who's going to engage mm. with what. Um, you know, bad <laughs> frown faces and 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 bad engagement still makes money for Facebook. So just f- from clicks, it exactly. doesn't have to be good clicks. It's still engaging. And yeah, for I guess maybe just quickly, for those who don't know, if, if I post an ad on Facebook, it, I, I'll have to pay if somebody sees it, then I pay a little bit more if somebody clicks on it or if somebody mm-hmm. likes it. There's sort of a different a cascade of effects that happens when someone interacts with your ad. And just like you're saying, it does not matter if the interaction leads to someone coming to check out the podcast. They could hit the frown face. I hate this podcast. It sucks. I pay for that. I, yes. I pay more money and you know they have my credit card. It just t- tallies it up. I just give them a cap. I only want to spend $50 on that ad. I might blow through $50 I- I- overnight on people that don't care about the podcast. They don't care. Exactly. And, and that's why these scammers are looking for engaging content and for, for trending products. You know, they're looking for the really cool stuff so that... Uh, you know, it, they get the information, they get the, the their credit card numbers and Facebook is not stopping us because they're getting the ad revenue and they're getting the information from the people who are clicking and engaging. When we spoke on the phone, you had mentioned, I, I'm forgetting now, the bill that was sort of protecting these social media companies, you know, they're, they're sort of hiding behind. Uh, yes, some, Section some, 230. Uh, yeah, can you talk uh, about Section 230? Section 230 is... Uh, part of what created the internet and it causes the platform or or it gives a a liability shield to a platform for third-party content essentially they can host anything that's that's up there as long as they don't create it and they are not liable for what's said on their platform with a few exceptions and one of those is human trafficking and the other is copyright so you can't take a copyright protected work and have carte blanche with that on a social media platform. They have to be held accountable for that. Um, And hopefully, finally, they will be. Um, They need to be treated as publishers. And if they know that there is fraud being perpetrated on their platform, they need to act. And so I think that's a really good, important distinction for the listeners. You know, you wouldn't want a world where something like Facebook or Twitter were charged if somebody made a tweet that said, I'm going to go commit a crime. You know, that's the shield, that liability shield that they want. But but there is that provision in the law that says you can't allow copy writ- stolen material that has been copywritten mm-hmm. to be, you know, perpetuated on the platform. And that's where that that's where they need to act more like a publisher, where if you're a publisher for a magazine, then you are responsible for what's in your magazine because you are what cater, you're the person that catered it, uh, you know, catered the, the material. Yes. So that's what we're, what we're talking about here. You can't allow, yes, we want to give them the shield for most things because that would be crazy if, if not, because how many people use those platforms, but we, you can't perpetuate stolen goods over and over and over again. No, and you shouldn't perpetuate violence and you shouldn't perpetuate crime in general, whether it's it's copyright or not. I mean, there's the cryptocurrency crimes, there's the movie stars and the personalities who've had their likeness uh, essentially mm-hmm. stolen for uh, promoting, uh, again, fraudulent products, whether it's um, CBD or cryptocurrency or investments or you know, a shipping crate. You shouldn't be able to use someone else's likeness to sell your products unless they give you permission to do so. And you should not be able to sell someone else's things unless you are legally able to sell the thing. Absolutely. Um, You know, and we're getting into the whole mess with copyright, with artificial intelligence and AI generators. And um, unfortunately, right now, the the internet is really a, a wild west situation 
where uh, we're dealing with international laws and some of them don't translate from one country to another. And the protections aren't the same, even though we've had the same treaties and, and um, agreed on some of these things. So there's really no uh, overarching framework to handle all of this. And what about the class action lawsuit that you're, you're moving forward with? Can you talk a little bit about that? The class action is on behalf of creators who have had their images and product descriptions pirated uh, and then the ads placed on social media and then the ads not coming down um, after reporting that it is a copyright infringement and fraud. Uh, I myself have notified over 120 artists that their artwork has been pirated and used for these scams. Um, and unfortunately, the class action is only for U.S. artists. But if you have an Etsy store or even just had your, um, your artwork from social media and, and had your images taken to be used for false advertising on social media, then you can um, can join the the lawsuit. Um, it currently we don't have class certification yet. Uh, however, the the judge decided that the Section two hundred and thirty protections that Facebook uses and Instagram uses are not valid. That they must stand trial for uh, vicarious and secondary copyright infringement for allowing this to happen. I mean, they have the button on to report a post to to tell it it's it's stolen. It's a fraudulent post, and they're not using it. Yes, and they also have um, uh, a button that is in the the ad library to report scams uh, that was a result of the Martin Lewis uh, case in Great Britain, where his likeness was used to promote cryptocurrency and false investments. And so he sued Facebook and he got the scam button so that you can report an ad as a scam. Mm. But you, I don't know how many times you have to report that for them to even look at it. And it doesn't seem to matter because the ads are still up and his right. likeness is still being used for fraud. And our images are still being used for fraud and it's still all over the platform and it just keeps coming back over and over and over again. And it becomes the small, like the little person that that gets all the damage. You know, you have these giant companies, Facebook, they're getting paid, the, the this crime syndicate in Asia, they're getting paid and they're this giant conglomerate as well. And then it's the people who are at home working hard, trying to make a living off of their own work that mm -hmm. are having to pay for this. Yes, and it's the people who have have bought the cool things that they've seen on social media who are not receiving the cool things they see on social media. I mean, most of these people are small businesses and, you know, they've worked very hard on their product. They've worked very hard on their artwork. It's special to them. Um, it's meaningful to them. And this is how they get, this is how they pay for their groceries is to sell these things. Uh, through their platforms, and then to have their images taken um, is just traumatic and so wrong. And then to have their reputation smeared because suddenly the the website that stole their images is no longer there, and the angry people that bought the scam has found the original artist and said, "This isn't this isn't what it looks like." Um, it, it's just destroying so many people and so many creators. What, what sort of damages would Facebook be liable for if, if they were found responsible for this? Or do you not know that yet? I do not know that yet. Um, and it depends on the number of infringements uh, and the number of, of pieces that have been stolen. Uh, that I know of one artist personally who's had 12 pieces pirated. Um, wow. Yes. And if a piece is popular, they will come back to the person's website or their social media and they will take everything else and then they'll run a scam on that. So it's never ending. Um, and they're just... Is it mostly like physical, like, like uh, sculpture type stuff that's being f created or is it, you know, artwork as well, like pictures and, and <sighs> paintings? Uh, it's pictures and paintings. There's the print-on-demand shops um, that will take um, 
there have been several painters that I've talked to, uh, oil paintings, that they will take images of it and then um, pr- either print on canvas or print on a poster. And it's a, you know, a crappy pixelated picture, but they're stealing the original artist's photographs. So it looks like it, it you know, you're buying based on the photograph and the price and what you're getting is not. Um, and then I have also spoken with digital artists who have either digital illustration or 3D prints. I mean, it's really everything from shoes to shipping containers to uh, whirly gigs to windmills. One of the huge scams was um, a, a metal windmill. That, it was a kinetic sculpture by Anthony Howe. This thing's massive. It's the size of the room. And it's tens of thousands of dollars or hundreds of thousands of dollars because it's all gears and ball bearings and and it rotates. But now it's a cheap $5 aluminum windmill uh, that's coming from China that is, you're lucky if it's even uh, still intact when it gets to you. So it's everything from you know, Clark's shoes to cars, to puppies, to, uh, artwork. Um, it's really pervasive and across the board. You know, you've gone through this for almost two years now, and Mm -hmm. I'm sure you've acquired some expertise Mm -hmm. on how to stop this as much as possible. So maybe we could kind of wrap up on Mm -hmm. if there is somebody who's an artist that's listening or somebody that's potentially, like you said, wanting to get into maybe sell stuff on Etsy and whatnot. What are some things, what what are some check marks they have to hit to make sure to to sort of put up some firewall to to prevent this from happening? At a minimum, upload low res images. Don't ever upload a high res image. I would recommend watermarking across the surface so that if that watermark is lifted, that it's a, um, an obvious thing that you, you would have to have some real Photoshop done to, to change that image. Um, monitor your work, you know, check the likes, check, do reverse image search on Google. Um, If you find your artwork stolen, report it. If you find someone else's artwork stolen, tell them because only the owner of the artwork only or their legal representative, so only the creator or their legal representative can report copyright infringement through a DMCA form. If you can't report it on behalf of me, I have to be the one to report it. And if the artist doesn't know, they can't report it. Um, so tell the artist that, Hey, you know, your work's being used. It's being pirated. Um, don't share ads. Don't share or like something that you know is a scam. Um, that just perpetuates it. Um, tell other people that if they see it, that, that it's a scam, you know, educate your friends. Um, if you are going to monetize your work, like if you're going to sell copies of your work, apply for copyright. Get the official registered copyright uh, if you're a U.S. artist. And non-U.S. artists, international artists can get U.S. copyright as well. It, you have to defend your own artwork, unfortunately. And you have to defend the other creators that you know. Uh, tell your friends, tell, and, and tell the artists if you see their work being pirated. And, and you'd mentioned that you, you originally had the e-commerce website and now you no longer do. What, what fail safe did that remove? Well, it slowed down the bots. Okay. So there are spyware bots that will instantly scrape all new products on an e-commerce site and they're tagged to e-commerce sites. And gotcha. there's certain snippets of codes so if someone wants to go to a website and scrape the images and scrape the content, unfortunately, there are screenshots and there's right click. Um, so it is still possible to do so. And if they really want the content, they're going to take it. Um, but you can fight back. And there are things that you can do. And really, awareness is the biggest thing. Uh, if it looks too good to be true, it probably is. If it looks mm-hmm. too cheap or um, 
too cheap to, for the quality of the images that you're seeing, then not everything is mass produced. Um, do a little research, look at it and see if, you know, take the, take the URL of the shop and then Google that with reviews or scam and see if somebody's already reported that this is a scam website. You know, you've got to be very protective of your information and your, um, your financials. You, you can't just give that away. Yeah, don't buy things from a URL peachuli.net. That, that should be a good red <laughs> flag for you. But I, I bet you could also reverse image search as well. That might be a good practice for people to do, right? If you see an item that you like, you could just easily reverse image search that on Google and just see what pops up. Yes. And if there are 100 or 50 websites that are using the same image over and over and over again, that's usually a red flag that it's a scam. Um, yeah. If something is truly remarkable and it looks amazing um, and handmade, it's not going to be on 50 different websites. You're not going to have one person doing handmade stuff on 50 different websites. So you really need to look and see um, and pay attention and do your homework. Um, many of the artists that have been pirated, if you do that reverse image search, though, their website is going to be all the way up page 10 because there have been thousands and thousands and thousands of websites that are using those same images to, to, promote, to promote the scams. Um, so you really have to look. I think those are some great tips and it's just such an unfortunate evolution of uh, the technology, the internet. And uh, as mm -hmm. you said, as you know, things evolve now, getting into more of this AI stuff, it sounds, it's like it can become more difficult than ever. But I hope you don't lose motivation to continue producing beautiful art because what, what you have produced and, you know, looking at your website and portfolio, it's really remarkable and incredible. And I, and getting back to the first half of the conversation, just the, your, the message that you're trying to spread with doing the art, I think is beautiful. And I, I love that. Is there anything else that we, we didn't mention today that you wanted to mention before we wrap up? Um, that there are still good people out there. There are still, um, the internet is an amazing way to contact uh, like-minded people and make friends that you wouldn't normally uh, have the ability to contact. Um, technology is advancing. Laws are advancing. Uh, one of the things that is the most promising that I have had the privilege of being a part of is a startup company. And there are others that are coming along that actually use artificial intelligence to find copyright infringement and report on copyright infringement and notify the artists. So AI is being used as it should be used to determine authorship and to help police our rights as creators for this content to make sure that it does come back and that we are um, attributed as, as the authors. Yeah, that's a good, you know, that sort of ending on a positive note, it's nice to see AI being put to some good use. Can you let everybody know, first, you'd mentioned those, a couple of those scam buster groups on Facebook. Maybe you could mention what the, the, the names of those are, so roughly, how, so people can go check those out if they're interested. And then please let everybody know where they can find more information about yourself and your artwork. And if they want to purchase some art, how do they go about doing that? Right now, again, I am only going to do uh, shows like Tinley. and. Okay. Um, and galleries. Now, if you want to uh, purchase my artwork, you can contact me through my website, which is snakearts.com. And I will do private sales as well. Um, the, the scam busting groups are Facebook ads, scam, scam busters. Um, th then there's stop the scam ads and what I bought versus what I got. Um, and you've seen so many posts uh, that, you know, I bought this thing online and this is what I actually got. And, and many of those have scam busting groups attached to them. Um, but pay attention and, and again, notify the artist if you know who it is that so they can take action. Can you let everybody know your Instagram? I know you have Instagram as well. It's jlcook underscore 3D and jlcook sculptor. 
on Facebook. Well, Jennifer, thank you so much for for coming on the podcast and sharing your story. And like I said, I, I love the message that you're using your artwork to promote. And I hate that you're going through all this other, you know, the fraudulent fraudster situation. But hopefully, at the end of the day, it does. You know, maybe there's always good that comes out of a bad situation. And it sounds like you're the right person to to spearhead this this problem, despite how stressful and horrible it has been for you. So, thank you so much for the work that you're doing, and thank you very much for coming on the podcast. Thank you, Dylan. All right. That is the end of that episode. Jennifer, thank you so much for joining me. I had a blast chatting with you. I think it's fascinating to hear how you're using your art in order to tackle the sort of that misinformation and fear that comes with reptiles and particular, particularly snakes. And that's something that many keepers are trying to do at the same time. Like we're always trying to promote these species as, as you know, nothing to be afraid of, it, rather respecting them rather than fearing them. And it's amazing that your artwork is doing that as well. And it's something that I hadn't really thought about before, but now after talking to you, I can totally understand how that is a great avenue to help people get through those fears. And And your work is beautiful and incredible. And I really hope that even if this episode has a small percentage of positivity when it comes to stopping this crime syndicate, this fraud culture that we have bubbling underneath the surface of all this creative work that we're doing, uh, if it does have any positive effect, I, I'm, I'm hopeful of that. And hopefully your work continues to do that as well. Listeners, thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, the best thing you can do is just share it. Share it on social media or Instagram. This is the type of word, the the, the content that we want to get out to the wider community because it is so important. And and again, Jennifer gave us steps to help protect your own intellectual property if you are someone producing something creative. Or if you aren't producing creative, we can all keep our eyes open. We can all be the the sort of community watchdog watching to make sure that this, this, if you see an artist that looks like they're being ripped off in some capacity on social media, make sure you let that that artist know. If you want more information on the podcast, head to animalsathomenetwork.com. If you'd like to join us over on Patreon, we have an incredible team of people over there helping me produce the show. You can do that at patreon.com slash animals at home. Custom Reptile Habitats is the sponsor of the podcast. You can find them at custom. Oh, sorry. Actually, I shouldn't say that. <laughs> I was going to give you the URL, but the URL for my affiliate link is a bunch of characters that are too hard to remember. So just go to the affiliate link in either the YouTube description or the show notes. Just click on the Custom Reptile Habitats badge or just click on where it says in the YouTube description and that will take you to their website. You can browse through their items. If you do end up making a purchase, a small commission comes back to me at no extra cost to you. And of course, that is another way you can help produce the show. If you're looking for animals at home t-shirts or sweaters or hoodies, you can do that at animalsathome.ca slash shop. $5 automatically gets donated to the Amazon Rainforest Conservancy. I think we're well over $1,500 donated to that conservation so far. I'm super proud of that. And I think that is it for today. Thank you guys so much for listening. I will catch you in the next episode.